introduction and and then we'll uh wait for you and then you can control the recording and we'll get started from there absolutely thank you jeff and welcome to everybody this is mario brown calling in from highland utah it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight thank you to all the live listeners that are with us and just as a reminder this call webinar will be recorded uh tonight we are super excited as you might see we have another person on the screen tonight we and also it's the start of our featured guests tonight we have Jordan Adler from Vegas he's currently in Vegas he's the best-selling author of Beach Money and MLM entrepreneur it's a privilege to have you on the call tonight thank, thank you, you Jordan we also in addition to that we have our own superstar Jeff Welch who will be training us continuing on with the training and tonight he's gonna focus on the dynamics of culture He'll explain exactly what that is and why it's important in growing our business. Now, we have a lot of new people on the, the call tonight, and so I wanted to briefly introduce Jeff Welch. Jeff Welch is someone that I've known for many, many years, and I met him as a corporate executive, and it's been about 15, 16 years, and Jeff and I have traveled to the world together. Uh, my responsibility as a corporate executive has always been to work directly with the top distributors or brand partners, and that's where I met Jeff. Jeff was someone that absolutely stood out, someone that I trusted, someone that I saw had a huge passion for success and helping others, and just a huge mentor. So it's a privilege to have both Jeff and Jordan on the line tonight. We have a lot to discuss. It's very, very exciting. So let's go ahead and get started. Jeff, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Well, it's such a pleasure to have everyone on the call with us this evening. Thank you so much, Mario. And it's such a, a pleasure and an honor to work with someone with such high integrity as you have. And, and it's such a pleasure to have our guest that we have on our call tonight as well. As you know, these, these webcasts are all centered around prosperity, sustaining the prosperity of an individual that's in the network marketing profession. It's, it's one thing to join a network marketing company and to grow your business and to get it to a place where you're prosperous. But it's another thing to keep that prosperity going and to keep that momentum going and to keep the stability maintained. And that's why that we entitle our process the sustained prosperity system. It's not just a prosperity system. It's a sustained prosperity system. So we're working very organically within the international markets to build not just with a big flash or a salesperson mentality, but to actually reach beyond that. Uh, one of the things that Jordan posted earlier today on Facebook was very uh, inspirational. It actually was talking about 80% of the people who join network marketing, they join it on emotion. And uh, when people join network marketing on emotion, and 80% of that is that's the case, obviously, we need to realize that many of the battles that we face in network marketing are emotional battles. You enter into it with an emotional high, and you experience the emotional crashes as you continue through your process of learning all the different ways of doing your business correctly. So uh, we see this in many companies. They'll have a large bell curve going up, and then they'll have the big party and then all of a sudden there'll be a few ripples and they're not ready for it. They're not stable because they've built everything on emotion. They haven't built it on a systematic approach. They haven't built it on a stability based on how to actually do the business like a business. It's been like a party to them and that's great. It's fine. But there comes a time when everyone's feet needs to hit the ground. They need gravity. They need to be able to continue on with their business in a very stable manner. So what we're doing here with this webinar is we're helping people understand how to do their business with their feet on the ground, even if their head's way up in the air. So it's, it's an emotional business. Now about 3% of the people out there have what we'd call a salesperson mentality, a three to 5%. And if you want to narrow down your, your market, then you need to be a salesperson. You need to be a very pushy type person just to drive that sale. But our guest tonight, our featured guest, Jordan Adler, is an expert, an artist in relationship marketing. Not salesmanship, but relationship. 
So I love this. It's, he's perfect for the fit of what we have been talking about. One of the things that we've been doing, uh, especially in our teams over in Korea and some of the Asian markets, we've been implementing this organic growth based on people who have no experience in network marketing and helping them get to a large, substantial income as quickly as possible. And the only way this can happen is if there has to be systematic, consistent steps to the approach of getting there that do not get altered by the two worst enemies in network marketing, which of course basically is procrastination and rejection. Rejection, again, is an emotional battle. It's an emotional delay, while procrastination is a mental delay. So if we can cancel out these two worst enemies in network marketing, then you have won that battle as you cancel out rejection, you cancel out procrastination, you cancel out these delays that are working on your mind and you're able to actually put your feet on the ground and move forward. Now, tonight we are honored to have Jordan Adler. Uh, he's a, not just a, a network marketer. I consider Jordan Adler a personal friend and someone I admire very highly. And I can tell you that Jordan is one of the network marketers I would consider in this industry that I would trust. I would be very confident that if I needed to leave the keys of my car with someone, I could leave it with, with Jordan or the keys to my home. What kind of I'd car do you have? Even the checkbook. You know, the, Jordan is one of those guys that, uh, that I truly trust and I admire. And when my son was in the hospital a few months back, uh, Jordan was one of the first people who reached out and just said, hey, how is everything? What can I do for you? Is there anything I can do? And I can tell you that Jordan is one of those guys that, uh, even though he's been very successful, he does not allow his ego to get in the way. Now, we're, we're in an industry where people's egos are sometimes out of check. Sometimes their egos are bigger than their check. And um, Jordan is one of those gentlemen in the industry, in our profession, that truly does care about the people in his team, in his organization, and also the profession, those people who are not even in his organization or his team. And I really admire you, Jordan. I really admire you a lot. You've moved to Vegas four years ago. You've, uh, you've made some changes. You, you're, you're no longer uh, the beach bum, you know, and, and <laughs> you know what? My domicile is here, but I live uh, in I live in Arizona, and I spend a lot of time on the beach. You, you oh, there you go. I, that's 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 good to go. The, the one thing that I can say, Jordan, is when you first started in the business you're in, and you have a very unique product in the company you're in. It's it's, it's it blew my mind. I mean, I was just absolutely astonished how well you guys did in your business. And I know you're at send out cards and it's about a relationship marketing business. You're, you're sending these cards out everywhere to everyone. And it's, it's, it's admirable because I can remember when you started and some people reached out to me and said, Oh, you've got to get in, get into this. And I said, you got to be kidding. There's no way that this company is ever going to make it off of, off of greeting cards. Are you joking? Are you kidding me? Oh, and then yeah. all of a sudden, Jordan Adler comes into the company, and you have absolutely hit some home runs because I, I don't think it's just about the product. I think it's because your model is truly relationship marketing, and you fit that so well. Well, and, and really, Jeff, that's what we do. And, and I don't really, whatever company someone is involved in, it's really about a lot of people using a little bit of product every day, whatever the company is. It's a lot of people. It's, it's hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people using a little bit of it. So none of us make a lot of money on any one specific user. It's just a lot of people you know, like if, 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 it's a, if it's a shot that you take every day, I don't mean liquor, I mean, you know, your nutritional supplement, if it's something you rub on your skin or brush on your teeth or whatever it is, you know, the most you could ever make off of one customer is maybe a few pennies a day, but you get a lot of people doing that and you've got money pouring to your account. It's the same in our business. You know, we don't, it's just, uh, it's a product that people use every day and they spend a few pennies every day and we make, or they spend a few dollars every day and we make a few pennies every day. Get a it's, lot a story of, it's a story of network marketing, right? Uh, 
it's called leveraging. It's yeah. leveraging the masses. And, and I've always said the definition of, of duplication is to lead a large group of people to do a few simple actions over a sustained period of time. And, and that's what you're doing. You're duplicating happiness. You're duplicating fun and you're duplicating good things. That's what you're doing. It's, you're having a great time. And now Jordan, you have a unique success story. Uh, we're in this crazy industry called network marketing that some people, when we talk about it, they want to run. Yeah. But I think the reason a lot of people won't run is because so many people don't know really how to do it and they're left out there alone and, and they don't have the guidance of professionals like you and professionals like others. And I'm going to throw a question at you that you probably didn't put on your little sheet here for me to ask you. What do you do to support your team? What do you do to make sure that your team comes out of the gate equipped? What do you do with that new person? How yeah. do you bring that new person? How do you embrace them? And do you have a culture of nurturing? Yeah. So, so one of the things that I've learned over the years is, is, and I've seen this happen a lot where a new person will come into a company and then they'll be given everything all at once. And it's a brand new person. They've got a family, they've got a job many times or a traditional business. And they, they plan on working their business of maybe in the beginning, just a few hours a week, but then we dump a whole bunch of stuff on them and they get really overwhelmed and, and shut down. And so one of the things that I do is I, the, the, I give them by, uh, enough that they can get started, but I want them to get some immediate success. So, um, you know, first thing we got to do is orient them on the product and everybody's got a different orientation for their company, but I give them a very, I give them enough that they can get started using it. If you're a nutritional company, you teach them how to use the product every day. In our business, I teach them how to use the product every day. That's the first thing I want them to do. Second thing I want them to do is I want them to get some appointments on the calendar and I don't need to give them a lot of training to do that. I just need to get a two or three or four people on the calendar where we can go together and show the business to somebody and see if we can get one or two distributors or customers started underneath them and they can observe me do that. And it's not a complicated thing. So I, I'm using, you know, I'm, I'm using texting now almost exclusively to set up appointments with people. So I'm going to give them a couple of simple texts and have them text it out. I'm going to ask them to send 20 texts in 20 minutes with me where they're going to send the text. They can pick whoever they want to send the text to. It can be out of state or in state but I'm going to have them send 20 texts in 20 minutes. And from that, those texts, they're going to get anywhere from three to 10 appointments on their calendar. And then we're going to do some meetings together. And that's it. Like I don't, and the rest of it, they're going to get. So we do a weekly conference call similar to this, but it's not video. We do a weekly conference call every Monday night. I've been doing that for 11 years with, and I rarely miss one. Um, but every month, every single Monday night and I record it, I use instant teleseminar. I record it and I archive it so they can go back. So any, New distributor that comes in, they can go back and listen to past calls. And I've got every week is a different topic. And we train on, on specific things. Like tonight, you're training on culture. We'll train on a, a different topic every week. Like one, one night, we might talk about how to do the texting strategy. Another night, we might talk about how to present the system, the product. Uh, another night, night, we might talk about how to handle rejection or you know, what are the three different types of people? And so every week we spend 20 to 30 minutes on a conference call. We record it, put it out online, and then every new distributor directs people there. We also want to get the, the, that brand new person to the next event, whatever that event is. If it's a, a, a boot camp or a, or a regional event or an international convention or whatever it is, we're, we're working to get that new person at least committed to going. We may not be able to get them there right away, but we'll get them committed on the calendar. So that's really about it. I mean, it's real simple getting someone started. The key is to get them, get them plugged into the system so that they're, they'll learn everything as they go. But initially, our most important uh, function is to get them using the product every day and then get a few uh, appointments on the calendar so that we can, sh we can show the business together to some of the people that they know, help them have some immediate success. Now, Jordan, you're hitting on something here that's that, and, and I love you, man. I really do. I think the world of you, you are making very good income in network marketing. You, you've hit one of the greatest home runs and you're not making just a small check. You passed up one of the big checks years ago and now you're still rising. So 
to have one of those mega checks, not just one of those massive checks, mega checks like you're, you're receiving. The the question, the, I'm sorry? The commas and the zeros. The commas and the zeros, right. The commas and the zeros. And this call is not about announcing how many, how much people make and all that kind of thing. But, but the question is, do you still recruit? Do you still go out every day? Do you still constantly do what your downline is doing? Or do you just reach a certain point and just let it go? What are you actually doing on a daily basis? Uh, do you know the answer to the question? I do. <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, I still, you know, it's in my nature now. I'm effortlessly, and I will talk a little bit about that too, the effortlessly. Uh, but effortlessly, I will meet anywhere from three to 10 people a week. I'll text them, you know, I'll, I'll connect with them. Like it might be, medium in person, getting their business card, shaking their hand, having a conversation. I met a guy at uh, the Starbucks yesterday. His name's Joe. I don't even know his last name. He wrote down his email address and phone number for me. We got in a very short conversation. I complimented him on his motorcycle, and we ended up talking for five minutes, found out about his family, what he does for a living, and he actually said to me, if you know anybody that's, that, that's looking to hire, uh, I'm, I'm looking right now. He's working for his family business. And I said, write down your number and your email address. I didn't tell him anything about what I do. And then I'll, I, I'm leaving town tomorrow, but I'll text him and I'll say, let's get together, Joe, for coffee. I want to learn more about you. That's it. I'm not going to tell him what I do until we're sitting down. I'll show him the whole thing. But, but yes, and I sponsor anywhere from two to four new personally sponsored distributors a month. I sponsored one last week. I've got a handful more in the pipeline. Every week I've got anywhere from three to five people in the pipeline. I, I sign up one person you know, a week or one person every other week, that kind of thing. And I'm helping them get started. I'm always creating new legs. You're addicted like I am. I love it. I love it. Now, Jordan, were you an overnight success or did it actually take you a while to figure it all out? Well, it was, anybody, it was that part of your story because I believe this is going to relate to so many people that's on this call this evening because I've heard your story and it's so dynamic. Could you share that with us? Yeah, you know, I, I was uh, living in Chicago in a small suburb in south suburbs of Chicago. To give you an idea of the neighborhood I grew up in, uh, I lost my father a year ago, December, and we sold the family home. And it was it was not uh, a bank foreclosure. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a repo or anything. It, it just, we just sold it on the open market when we lost my dad, and it sold for ten thousand dollars. That was the market value of the home that I grew up in. Shootings in the neighborhood once a week, um, and it. And my dad lived there up until he was 83 years old. That's the neighborhood. Now, it wasn't always like it is right now, but it was a lower income neighborhood. I didn't have any role models growing up. Moved to Arizona with a guitar suitcase and 250 bucks. The 250 bucks were birthday gifts. Uh, I was 22 years old. I worked jobs um, in the field. I went to college. Uh, I, I have a degree in landscape architecture. I worked my way through college. I paid my own way through college got the degree, moved to Arizona from Chicago, and I um, started applying for opportunities in the classified ads, and I was still working jobs, lots lots and lots and lots of different jobs. Never made more than $28,000 in a given year of any of those jobs, but I was in 11 network marketing companies in 10 years. While I was working jobs, I never signed up a single distributor and never made a penny and um, spent money in every program. Most of the time, I would, I'd get a credit card, I'd max out the credit card, and then they'd give me another credit card, and I'd max that one out, and they'd give me another one, and i max that out. That's kind of how it was in the 80s. And over the course of my first 10 years in network marketing, I'll, I'll tell you where I was when I joined my 12th company. I was $36,000 in credit card debt. I was living in an a enclosed garage in Tempe, Arizona, in a rental. Uh, my rent was $200 a month. I had two roommates. I had a broken down Jeep that was sitting in the uh, street that had been broken down for two years. I was taking the bus to work. Um, and my the company that I worked for, which was America West Airlines, they had just filed bankruptcy. And they cut my pay from $28,000 a year. And I'd been there for 10 years. They cut my pay from $28,000 a year to $14,000 a year when they filed bankruptcy. So $14,000 a year in income, 34 years old, making two, making two uh, or paying 200 bucks a month for rent, broken down car. Joined my 12th network marketing company. And that was Excel, as you know. And mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was there for 13 years and I finally figured out how to give a very simple presentation. I started three days a week. I would drag somebody to sit down and listen to me. 
and we'd sit down for coffee at Coffee Plantation on Mill Avenue. I'd usually grab people from America West Airlines that I worked with, sat them down and said, I want you to look at this. And I'd show it to them and about one out of 12 people would get involved. So I'd show the business three times a week. I would do that every single week. So it's 12 a month. I would sign up one person a month. So one out of 12 would say yes. And I did that for a couple of years. And there was a guy, you probably, do you know the name Russ Devan? Do you know Russ? Yeah. So yeah. Russ, uh, when Russ was quite, you know, we were all quite a bit younger. But when Russ was younger, um, I met him and he was, we never went into business together. But I, he invited me into his home. Um, he was living in what I perceived to be a mansion. I mean, he had a big circle drive and a fountain out front. And he was driving a sports car. He was married, had a little kid, and living the, the lifestyle. I mean, he had the lifestyle that I wanted, and I had never made a penny in network marketing. And he told me that if I would go out and personally sign up 20 to 30 people, take a couple years to do it. This is what he told me. He said, I'll never have to work. You'll never have to work again. That's what he told me. I believed him. Now, whether it was true or not, I believed him. So I started signing up one a month, and I put my I put my nose down and I started showing the business three times a week, every single week. I never missed a week. Some, some weeks I showed it five times, some weeks I showed it two times, but I focused on three a week and my goal was to sign up one person a month. And after two years, I'd signed up 19 people. My 16th distributor was, you know, Jackie Ulmer. My 16th distributor was Jackie Ulmer. She had never done network marketing before, married to an airline pilot. She signed up a woman in New Mexico, Judy Dubiel. Judy started doing home meetings, and within the next three years, that group grew to 12,000 distributors and 40,000 customers, made me my first million. I made eight million bucks in that company, and that was, and I left my job after about a year and a half. Too soon. I left my job too soon, but they were in bankruptcy, and I just started focusing on the business. It took me three years before I got any traction. In fact, at the end of my first year of doing what I just described, I was making $180 a month. My 11th month, I was at 180 bucks. By the end of my second year, I was somewhere in the range of, well, by my 15th month, I was at 1200 bucks a month. By the end of my second year, I was somewhere in the range of $2,500 a month, which for me was full-time income. I, I just left a job that was paying me $14,000 a year. So I'm making $2,500 a month. Not that I'm rolling in dough or anything like that, but I was doing better than I was at my job. Had expenses and had to pay taxes and all that, but I was struck. it was tough for the first couple of years. My third year... By my 33rd month, things started to skyrocket. Between my 33rd month and my 40th month, my checks went over 34000 a month. And then from there, it just, I just started, the business really took off. But it was 33 months before, and it was working the business for 33 months. Now, that company went away. I was there till the bitter end, and it went away. And then I joined, 11 years ago, I joined the company I'm with right now. And the only difference, Jeff, is what I did here versus what I did over there. Over there, I was doing three appointments a week. Over here, I did five to eight appointments a day. So I started, I, I just hit the phones. We didn't, I wasn't texting so much back then. Now I text, but back then I was just hitting the phones and calling people, say, I want to show you something. When can we set up a time? And, and I started doing that multiple times a day, and, and my business exploded. By my fifth month, my checks skyrocketed because I was showing the business so much for myself and for other people on the team. So, Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What an amazing story. What an amazing story. So now, Jordan, you believe that just making a minor adjustment in one's thinking can completely change and shift their business into overdrive. Can you explain what you're talking about when you tell that? So in your, in your tell, I'll just tell a quick story. I've got a place, as you know, in the mountains of Arizona in an old mining town called Jerome, Arizona. It's an old historic town, and I've had a place there for 15 years. And about a year ago, um, I left, I leave the doors open and windows open during the, the summer because it's so beautiful, you know. So I leave, I left the door open and on the deck looking out over Sedona and uh, a hummingbird flew into my place and it flew straight over to the picture window and it was buzzing against the window and I, tr and I was leaving, I was getting ready to leave and head out of town for like three weeks. I wasn't going to be back there and I knew if I left the hummingbird in my house, he would die. And so I was trying to wave him to go towards the door, just trying to get him to go out, but he wanted to go towards the window. And uh, he did that for like 45 minutes. It was getting exhausting. I went in the kitchen and got a pitcher, and I tried to kept catch him with a pitcher, and you can't catch a hummingbird. I don't know if you ever tried to catch a hummingbird, but they're so fast, so fast. Well, eventually he got tired, thank God, and he kind of sat down on the bottom of the windowsill, and I took the pitcher, and he sat on the little rim of the pitcher, and I walked him outside, and he flew off. But I thought to myself, you know, one direction represents struggle and death, 
and the other direction, just shifting that little hummingbird's focus towards the door is effortless, and it leads to freedom. And what the hummingbird is actually doing, it's flapping its wings and focusing in a direction. That's just, that direction is, I mean, that flying is just what the hummingbird does. I mean, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to work for it, it just does it. But one direction represents struggle and death, and the other direction is effortless and leads to freedom. And sometimes in our business, and this is what I had to do, you know, sometimes in our business, it's just a matter of shifting our focus and, and focusing on things that successful people focus, focus on. And success can be effortless, just like the success of that hummingbird can be effortless when you focus on the right things. When I find myself starting to struggle, and I know, Jeff, you can relate to this, there's been times, even as much success as you've had, there's been times during that journey that you start to struggle. And if you really step back and look at it, you realize that the reason you're struggling is because you're focusing on the wrong things. Like you're focusing on all those people that left, or you're focusing on that one negative person that ruined your day, or you're focusing on your fears, or you're focusing on everything that's not working in your life. And those are the kinds that that focus leads to death, metaphorically. It leads to death. So it's Shifting your focus, reading personal development books, getting to the events, focusing on what the successful people do, that, and, and then success becomes effortless. And if it's not effortless, it's usually, you take a look in the mirror, usually it's because we're focusing on something that is causing us to, to freeze up, to, causing us to, to uh, experience fear versus um, you know, opening up the world to the opportunity that's at our feet, that are right, that's placed right in front of us. And that's what we've been talking about recently is all the emotional battles. Yeah. You know, when you're a brand new distributor or representative or brand partner of a company, one of the first things that we see is they'll join a business because they've gone to some party, you know, they've gone to some meeting, someone's up there speaking and they get bathed with this warm bath of enthusiasm, right? And and they wake up the next morning and want to know, what did I get into? What, what did I join? Uh, and and it, they, they join the business off of emotion, like you were talking about recently. They join the business off of emotion. And then you go through the emotional battles. Everyone has humanity. Everyone has normality on a consistent basis. Network marketing is not a dream world. Even though we're building our dream, it's not a dream world. It's, it's our path to our dream in the human world. And, and, and we can't walk away from that. Man. And, and it's, yeah. it's such one of the most beautiful things that I see in network marketing is the relationships that we create and the ability and strength and the assets within that. Because our assets in network marketing is not just monetarily speaking. It's actually the assets of the relationships that we have created. Absolutely. And, and the relationships we create, not just with others, but the relationships that we have created with ourselves. Because we are learning who we are. We're gaining ground on who we are and the best person that we ourselves can be if we truly apply what we're learning in network marketing. Because network marketing is a leadership factory. It's a people factory. It actually helps people come out of their box. I've seen so many introverted people come out of their box and become some of the greatest leaders in our, in our profession. And you, Jordan, you build, and I'm kind of swinging back and forth here and taking you in a little different segues off of the path, but how do you stay so humble and how do you, how do you keep your ego in check compared to some other people? I mean, cause I can tell you, I've seen people with, um, you and I both have, been able to hit some home runs over the years. And, and that's, that's something we have in common and we can communicate that. But there's a lot of people who haven't hit a lot of home runs, but they feel like they have to really posture themselves with this strong ego to actually feel successful before they are successful or, or project something that they aren't. Can you give anyone here in this call advice in regards to that? Because I really do believe that you're probably the expert in being able to show everyone that real compassion and that passionate attitude from your level. Because well, most people at your level are not that touchable like you are. First of all, Jeff, you know, I don't, um, you know, people kind of, they, they elevate you to this, 
expert level or this guru level when your checks get big. And, and I'm just like humble as far, I, I just appreciate where I'm at and realize that everything is held together with very thin threads. I mean, I'm no different. You know, in Paul, Simon, Paul Simon and Garfunkel's song, The Boxer, you know, there before the grace of God go I. Um, you know, we're just like, you know, the difference between the homeless guy on the street and you and me is sometimes a couple of little decisions, you know? So, yeah. So I just, yeah. uh, I, the way, I, the way I have always viewed my business is that I, I'm not lucky because I do the work and I've definitely gone through the, um, I am lucky, but I'm also, I guess what I'm saying when I say I'm not lucky, I'm not, I, um, I do the work and I've really worked on my personal development and, and surrounded myself with good people. But I also know that when somebody's truthful with you, the people that have the big checks in our profession, they figure out how to give a presentation, they figure out how to sponsor people, and ultimately someone comes into your group. Sometimes it's not even someone you brought in. It could be somebody in your second, third, fourth tier generation that comes into your business that has a big network that's ready, that's a good communicator, and they go out and build a business of 10 or 20 or 30,000 people, and all of a sudden your checks skyrocket because that person joined your team. And then everyone wants to know your secret, and then they want your autograph, and then they, you know, uh, they want you to speak at their events, and it's like what you did was you, st you consistently showed the business, you consistently sponsored one to four new people per month, you kept go going until somebody came into your business that decided that they were just as serious or more serious than you were, built a big business, and you get credit for that. They do too, but you get some credit for that. And then all of a sudden you're kind of elevated to this guru or expert level and people want to know what your secret is. And then they press you for the secret. Like they want, like if you don't tell them, like if you give them an answer that's really simple, they want more. They expect more than that. So some people start to make stuff up. <laughs> you know, they start to create things. That, and that's what you see. Like there's a lot of stuff that's created in our profession that, really isn't what got people to where they are, but that's what it looks like because, so, you know, I'm all for education and I'm, I'm, I've got stacks of books everywhere, you know, and I'm constantly reading in three or four different books at the same time. And at the same time, I'm listening to audios and, and I'm going to events. I never miss an event. I, I also spend, personally, I spend ten dollars to $20,000 a year on my own personal development, going to retreats and trainings and, and those kinds of things. So I do all that stuff to prepare myself for what's next. But, you know, there really is not as much of a magic bullet as people think. If, if they would just follow the simple, it's like Michael Jordan, he mastered probably five or six things, the fundamentals. He knows strategy, he knows the basic, the five things that, you know, and he drilled those things for many, many, many years. And we do the same thing. If you get good at some basic things that you hear the experts talk about, just get good at those and get and just keep practicing them on the court, not in your living room, but actually out in the field. Practice them at the Starbucks. Practice them in the offices. Practice them in the living rooms. Practice them in the one-on-ones and two-on-ones and practice a lot. Within a short period of time, you're going to be good at them. And then people will start to join your team and your business will grow. So, yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen that are listening to the call, I want you to understand something about Jordan. Jordan is not only a network marketer, but he's also an author that has helped so many other network marketers with his book called Beach Money. And Beach Money has become a worldwide bestseller in its, in its category. And, and he donates 100% of the income he receives off of this book to charities. So, you know, There's Jordan, my <laughs> there you go. There's your, he carries his beach sand around with him everywhere he goes in a little glass vial. That's, that's great. I love the beach. The beach is, is, is my, uh, my weakness. I always tell everyone my goal is, is always just to have my heels stuck down in the sand and to build my business from the beaches all over the world. And, and that's where we have something in common. I love the water. I love the beach. And you do as well. That's, that's your game. You're a helicopter pilot now. You, you, you're living your dream. You're living your dream. But now you've adopted some simple principles that you do and you teach everyone to believe and, and how that will help you as an owner, help them to build their lives, right? So what are those principles that you talk about so adamantly? 
Yeah, so there's a few that I kind of live by, and, and these, are, these are principles that I adopted. I want to share this, that I adopted before I had a big organization. So these are, these are things that really helped me to, to build a team and keep my head in the game on days that weren't so great. So one is don't quit on a bad day. Um, because we all, anybody who quits network marketing quits on a bad day. They always quit on a bad day. It's like, I quit. This is the day. It's, it was a terrible day. I'm done, right? We, we declare it. We, I am done. I'm not dealing with this anymore. So I have a philosophy. Don't quit on a bad day. What I do on bad days, I might take a short break, like an hour or three. But what I do is I go back into action. And you've heard the saying, it's cliche. It's been around for years, but it's true. It's like action Doubt will take you out of action and action will take you out of doubt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something to advance my business on my difficult days. That's the first thing. Because what happens is if you get back into action quickly, like get back up on the horse, you're going to have a good moment. And if you just don't quit on a bad day, don't quit on a bad week, don't quit on a bad month. And I could bore you. Jeff could bore you with our stories about having tough months and tough weeks in network marketing. Even the, even the people with the big checks have tough weeks. Isn't that right, Jeff? That's exactly right. So the bigger your organization, the more problems you deal with every day. And that's just part of life. You know, I'll just, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but last year, a uh, year, year before last, I was standing backstage at Eric Worre's event. There were thousands of people in the crowd, 3000 people in the crowd. And, and, uh, I was, Curtis Broom was introducing me and as that was happening, I got a text message and I looked at my phone and, and it's my sister, this is Friday night, as I'm walking on stage, my sister texted me saying, dad's gonna die tonight. This is literally seconds before I walked on stage. And I had to decide at that moment, am I gonna, I, cause if I had said, I'm not going, Eric would have gotten up there and he would have, you know, he would have covered for me, I would, you know, but. The first one is don't quit on a bad day. The second one is don't make, then Jeff was talking about this a lot tonight. Don't make your decisions out of your, don't make your decisions out of your emotion. Make your decisions based on your commitment. And I had been teaching that for years. And so here I am faced with the situation. I knew I couldn't get back to Chicago Friday night. So do I make my decision based on how I'm feeling in that moment? Or do I make a decision based on what I'm committed to? And at that moment, I was committed to being up on the stage. I, I was crying backstage with Eric and Marina wrapping their arms around me literally 30 seconds before walking on stage. And I did my talk. And I thought about this. I make my decisions in my business based on what I'm committed to. Com are you committed to your family? Are you committed to your family's future? Are you committed to really having your dream? Are you committed to getting out of that job that you really hate? Are you committed to paying off your bills? What are you committed to? Make your decisions based on that, not based on how you're feeling, because your feelings, like Jeff said, we're human. Our feelings go up and down. And that's tough sometimes, because it's easy now, we're all, everybody on the call right now, all are nodding their head, yeah, I agree, I agree, but when you're in it, that's when it's tough. It's like when you are in the heat of that emotion, it's tough to say, I can't do this. It's easy to say, I can't do this. It's tough. Well, and, and, I, and taking you off that segue just for a moment, you know, of course, my degree is psychology, so I'm going to throw this at you yeah. for just a moment. And you've seen this and I've seen this in the relationship marketing business, which is network marketing business. Anytime that people enter into a relationship, whether it's a business relationship or if it's a personal relationship, whatever it may be, there's constant paradigm shifts in people's in their personalities. And, and we all change. And those changes, whether they're good or whether they're bad, they're very impactful. And, and the best way I can explain that is, is this. When you enter into a relationship, everyone has their securities and their insecurities, right? We all have our securities and our insecurities. No matter how strong we are, we all have our securities and our insecurities. So when we bond with others within a relationship, whether it's a business relationship or whether it's a personal relationship, what happens is, those personalities are mingling because those securities and those insecurities are mingling. Right. Well, when one person is becoming stronger, it may be making the other person feel more insecure or a person becomes more insecure. It makes the other person feel stronger in different areas. When these shifts are taking place, it causes personalities also redefine themselves because our personalities are defined by our insecurities and our securities. Correct. Yeah. So that's why when we enter in relationships, isn't it amazing 
that when we first enter in, into our relationships, whether it's business or personal, we feel like we know that person. We feel like we know that business person, or we feel like we know that companion, whoever it may be. And as soon as those paradigm shifts of securities and insecurities start changing personalities, everyone looks around and says, you know, something's different. Something doesn't feel right. It's, or or so, this person's changed, or maybe it's you that's really changed. Now, Jordan, we see this a lot in couples that get into network marketing where one person is the first time that they've been in network marketing before, or maybe the first time they ever had a, a good solid income. And all of a sudden, one has their job and the other one is growing their income in network marketing. And now this person's check is going up and it's equaling this other person's check and income. And now there's maybe family relationship issues that kick in. So I'm taking you in a segue here. You see where I'm going. Yeah. Have you ever seen this happen? And when you do, isn't it amazing how some of us, we, we can't get into it. We can't really approach those people necessarily, but I'm bringing this up for a reason. When you're a seasoned networker like you, I'm just using this as an example. We have to sometimes plan ahead. We have to train ahead. We have to compensate people's mentality and emotions ahead of time so that they're ready for the battle ahead, don't we? Yeah. I'm just using that one battle as an example. Recently, you know, we, we put the company in back order that I'm in, you know, in, in another country, and I had to tell the team before we did it, I said, now we're going to put the team, we're going to put the company in back order. So we're not going to get upset when they run out of products. We're going to go, yeah, we put the company in back order. So there's a plan ahead emotionally and psychologically to get your team ready for the changes that are about to happen that you know could be negatively impactful when you have to handle it in a positive way. You as a leader have that positive attitude. How do you handle things like that? Do you actually yeah. it a different way? You know, leading leading is really about um, positioning things in for your team and so that and and holding the vision for your team because you know there are going to be people that come into your team that are going to complain about stuff they're going to see the bad or the negative in situations and you as a leader even if you're brand new if you're just getting started and it's just you on your team in order for you to have a team you've got to be the leader so you've got to be the person that holds the vision for the team you have to be the person that reframes things so that people can see what's the what's the positive like you just talked about that Jeff like what what is it about being back ordered in another country that's good well you outsold you, you guys outsold the company's ability to uh, provide it so they've got to catch up to you that's a good thing so that's a reframing um, the other thing is what we're doing is we're preparing people for what to expect um, real life for example um, there are there, are, I'll give you two quick examples. One is for every 30 people that you sign up, this is the nature of people. It doesn't have to do with your company. It doesn't have to do with your product. It doesn't have to do with your comp plan. For every 30 people you sign up, a third of them will do nothing. A third of them will do a little. A third of them will do a little more than a little. And one out of 20 to 30 will do it big. And that's how it is in real estate. That's how it is in the fitness centers, the people that pay their monthly fitness membership, only about one out of 30 really get in great shape. A third of them work, never work out. A third of them work out a little. A third of them work out a little more than a little. They'll keep coming back once in a while. But one out of 20 to 30 are going to go out and get in perfect physical shape as a result of joining that gym. That's the nature of people. So we, we prepare people for that. We let them know you might, you might sponsor 10 people and have very little going on in your group. Just keep sponsoring the next one and then the next one and the next one. And then the people in that first 10, then a couple of them might start to percolate and go down there and, you know, work with them. But the other thing is, um, you know, there's skeptical people, there's cynical people, and there's people that are ready to play. And I teach people that. What's the difference between a skeptic and a cynic? What's the difference between uh, why are skeptics good and why are cynics bad? Why do you want to kind of disassociate yourself with the cynics and you want to answer the questions of the skeptics. You want to give the skeptic the information they need to make a good decision. They'll become your best distributors, better than the ones that are ready to run on day one. So I teach people those distinctions in my training. And if you're not ready to teach it, 
Jeff will, t will teach it for you, or there are other great trainers in our profession that will teach it for you, but you need to be able, you need to inoculate your team from those things that are going to happen out there that might knock them out of the business. And that's why I tell people, don't quit on a bad day. Don't make your decisions based on your emotion. Make them out of the equipment because I know they're going to have lots and lots of tough days. So I need to prepare them for those tough days. Now, let's talk about culture here for a moment because culture is extremely important. And culture and cult come from the same root word, of course, right? It's, it's like a bar of wet soap. If you have a culture that you hold on to tight, it's going to slip out of your hands and become a cult, right? Now, anytime that you look at a culture within a company, it's definitely in relation to a relationship. It's just like a relationship. If you hold on to it too tight, it'll slip out of your hands. It's like a wet bar of soap. If you hold on to a culture too tight, it becomes a cult and it becomes messy and slimy and it slips out of your hands. What happens is, and this is what I'm saying, if you're really going to develop a culture within your organization, you can't handle the scenario of building that culture if you're handling it from a narcissistic leadership mentality. Right. You, can't, you can't do it that way. And of course, anyone who understands a narcissistic leadership mentality needs to read the mythology between narcissist and echo. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a beautiful story of a guy who, you know, narcissist was stuck on beauty. He just, it was all about beauty. It was all about beauty. And, and then Echo was the beautiful nymph that followed him around and only could speak when he spoke and could only echo what he said. And that's the way a lot of leaders are. They, they want everyone around them just to echo what they say and just to only do what they tell them to do. And, and then narcissist eventually he sees his reflection in the pool of water and he, gazes upon his own reflection and thinks he's the most beautiful thing that ever was. And he never says anything else. And Echo never can say anything else again, because Echo is waiting for narcissists to say something when he's caught up into his own beauty. I, I see a lot of leadership like that within the industry that, that we can learn from. And I don't say this in a negative way, and I'm not being critical. I'm using this as a teaching method tonight that it's very important that we're not overly controlling of our organizations, but we allow creativity, that we allow people to actually spawn thought and we share thoughts with each other and we determine what should be uh, going forward within the organizations. It's, so if we're building a culture, that relationship is extremely important. Relationship marketing culture is definitely something that goes together. Jordan, I know I'm putting you on the spot with some of these questions and I'm trying to drive your mind here just a moment. How would you define a healthy culture within the relationship marketing business of leading others and to actually help them grow? Obviously, I want to lead them in following a system that's important to me just to keep them on track. And you have certain things you keep them on, keep them on track with as well. But I guess there is a line that we don't cross to where we are dictating people, right? We don't do that. We, we want them to grow also within their own ability and their own selves and not just be an echo of us. We want them to be a greater them, not just a greater mimic of us, correct? Yeah, so, so culture is kind of a set of values or beliefs. This is how I, how I view it. It's a set of values or beliefs, and every organization can have a different culture. For example, Harley-Davidson has a different culture than Apple or IBM. They all have different cultures, and those cultures are defined. They attract people that resonate with, they attract people that resonate with the values and beliefs that they've defined. And, so, and that's very clearly laid out by their, um, the way that they do business. So... For example, some organizations are just very, very aggressive. Other organizations are a little more passive. Some organizations focus on learning and personal growth. Some organizations focus on sales. So, you know, they're in, in sales and um, maybe bringing in people that already have grown to a certain level. I don't know. It's different for every organization. So what I believe personally, this is my own personal belief, is um, an organization that fosters creativity and also appreciation. So like, for example, um, I know that uh, 
when you give without the expectation in our in our organization we're an organization about kindness and appreciation so in our organization there's a culture of kindness and appreciation and we know that you get back what you send out so if you send out appreciation however you do that it's going to come back to you tenfold it's like you reap what you sow that's a culture some some organizations don't have that culture i think that's important also we have a culture of personal growth and development so we're constantly infusing the conversation of of personal development and making sure that you do something every day for your own personal growth because your organization will grow to the extent that you have personally grow right and that to the extent that you have expanded your um, capabilities to offer value so those kinds of things. And, and part of that growth as a leader we all if we're just depending on our own growth we obviously reach a certain lid, don't we? But if we surround ourselves with people who are stronger than we are, yeah. we're able to expand that lid. We're able to lift it higher. And one of the things I notice about you, you mingle and you connect with leaders from even other companies throughout sure. the industry. You mingle with people to lift your lid and to bring your level of expertise and leadership higher than your own ability to gain. Because you're surrounding yourself with leadership, and then and then another another thing that I think is real valuable in terms of culture is looking for ways that you can add value to other people's lives and other people's businesses, give way more value than you expect to get re in return, all, all the time. Like look for ways that you can like for for example, I always have books that I love. I always have extra copies of those books, and then what I'll do is I'll give those away to people that I think it could benefit them. I usually have three, four, five books with me of a specific book that I like. And I look for opportunities to give those to people because I just know it adds value. I'm not expecting anything in return, although I do know that it's going to lead to good things. It always does. Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of books, and I know we're coming here close to the end of the call tonight. Beach Money is absolutely a book that we'd all recommend that you, you get. You can get it on Amazon or, you know, Jordan can let you know exactly where he would like for you to go get it. Uh, before we close the call, but Beach Money is a book that actually, in my opinion, causes people to realize the dream. They they actually do realize the dream. You know, we're we're in a we're in an industry and a profession. We're in an industry that represents the companies, and we're in a profession that represents the field that keeps those companies alive and keeps those those organizations growing. And Jordan, you have totally depicted the true goals of what a network marketer's mindset should be on within the book called Beach Money. You, you caused everyone to realize it's not just about working or grinding your way through life. It's about doing something to actually live on vacation the rest of life. In fact, when people ask me, what do you do? Well, I live on vacation and I make my living on vacation and travel all over the world and that's what I do. And we do that. That's what we do. And, and then they start asking questions. What do you mean? I said, well, let me explain. No matter where I'm at, I'm building my business. I'm building it from the beach. I'm building it from the, the restaurant. I'm building it from a, an amusement park. I'm building it from an airplane. I'm building it from wherever I am, anywhere in the world. You have depicted that so well within the Beach Money book. It's about a lifestyle, isn't it? It's about that. It's not his lifestyle. It's an emotional awesomeness to a lifestyle. Yeah. You've yeah. actually so, depicted that dream. If you're going to map, if you're good, we, we all master something in our lives over the course of our lifetime. We master. If you're going to master something, why not master something that pays you over and over and over again for working once so that you can eventually really live your dreams and you can start living your dreams much sooner than you even think. I mean, it's not a matter of waiting. You don't have to wait. I mean, when you're making a thousand bucks a month, you can take 300 bucks a month and do something that's going to allow you to, to enjoy a part of your life that you couldn't enjoy before, you know, and, and always look for ways that you can expand your dreams and just dream a little bit bigger, stretch your dreams. Maybe write some things down that you feel like are impossible to you, but you know, if that was part of your life, it would just create some really amazing uh, things for you and your family and 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 write those things down and and challenge yourself to be a little bold in what you Create for yourself not and you don't even need to believe it when you write it down I didn't 
I didn't ever believe that I was going to be able to fly helicopters and be a helicopter pilot. Even while I was training, I really questioned whether it would ever really happen. I said that to my instructor a hundred times. Is this ever, am I really ever going to be able to do this? But, but it was one of your dreams. Right. And you fulfilled that section of your life dreams. And that's what is so wonderful about that. And you know, network marketing, I've seen so many people in network marketing. Look at me. I grew up on a chicken farm in North Georgia. I'm proud of that. I'm not ashamed of that. I grew up on a farm. We put out over 100,000 chickens on people's tables every eight or eight or 10 weeks. And that, that was a chicken farm. And, and I started up in the chicken houses, growing up in the chicken house, working in the chicken house when I was just a small kid. And I worked all the way through my childhood life in, on the farm. But, and now here I am, I've traveled to 60 plus countries. Wow. And I grew up on a chicken farm in North Georgia. I still love to go to the country and to enjoy the country life. I own two John Deere tractors, you know, and I have my little ranch in North Carolina. And listen, I noticed that about you. You don't forget where you came from. Right. That's what makes you so awesome, Jordan. You don't forget where you came from. And that gives you the ability to truly relate to the people who are listening right now that want to get to the dream where you have gone. And that's the key. You have not forgotten where you've come from. It relates to the people who are listening and helps them understand they truly can get to where you are now if they just will apply themselves. Jordan, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. I mean, it really is an honor. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. This sustained prosperity system. We have been training people that the first steps of follow-up is to build a relationship. Build a relationship between you and that person. Trust. It's all about establishing trust. Trusting the sponsor. Trusting the product. Trusting the company. By building a relationship, then you can get into the stages of commitment. And then eventually get into the stages of confirming that commitment and building your team. Step by step, it's all about building relationship. And it's about doing it right with integrity. And everything starts at the top. If you have integrity at the top, it's going to go all the way down to the bottom. If you don't have integrity at the top, that's going to go down to the bottom as well. And you have truly shown that building integrity at the top, you have been able to build an organization that has integrity all the way through its ranks. And so it's an honor, a true honor to have you as our guest, our special featured guest this evening. And uh, Mario, um, I want you to announce our guest for next week and, uh, and Jordan accept our, uh, accept our appreciation for you being on the call this evening. Thank Appreciate you for the invitation. It. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening and uh, look forward to seeing you out on the beaches. <laughs> awesome. 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 Thank you all for joining us this evening. We had a great call. We've learned so much. I took a lot of notes. Uh, I know we had people from all over the U S with us tonight from Asia, from Latin America. We've learned so much. Just so you know, this, car, this call is being recorded. So if you want to listen to that, you can email Jeff at Jeff at JeffWelch.com. That's with one F. And Jeff, are you also going to put this on your Facebook? Yes, sir. We'll do that. Be okay. glad to. Okay. So you can find it also on Jeff's Facebook. So next week, we have more superstars. I'm super excited about this. I mean, we had our first call today with Jordan. And we have several more weeks lined up. We have a husband and wife team, Travis and Summer Flaherty. And I've heard, you know, I've had many conversations with Jeff. Jeff highly respects them. They are top leaders in the industry. So make sure you're there with us next week, same time, same link, and make sure you invite everybody to be on the call. Thank you all for joining us tonight and have a good night. Bye-bye.